glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was a blight applied glory to his name in number 63 join with me on the first verse there down at the cross where my savior died down where from cleansing from sin i cry there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name one more verse on the last there come to this fountain so rich and sweet cast thy poor soul at the savior's feet plunge in today and be made complete glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood applied glory to his name amen. amen good to see you tonight thank you for being uh, in the lord's house uh, once again this evening and uh, the lord bless us this morning had a great service and praise the lord uh, for that um, uh, we'll give you some announcements at the end of the service and uh, help you out with that and uh, what well, this time we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. I want to show a video. We will have our regular scheduled uh, Mike Ray video on soul winning. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, you know we support missionaries and uh, around the world. We're thankful that we can do that. One of the things that we do support at South Shore Baptist Church is the Christian Law Association (CLA), and they are fundamental, independent, Bible-believing Baptists, and we're thankful that we can support them uh, on a monthly basis who knows when we might need them hopefully we won't all right but who knows when we might need them and uh, so we do support them brother david gibbs uh, started that in fact uh, he was brother lester roloff's lawyer back in the day uh, when the state of texas put brother roloff in prison or jail and uh, so he was his lawyer at that time but uh, he, he's a he's a great lawyer but i think more than that, he's a great man of God and a great preacher, all right? And uh, maybe some of you have had the opportunity to hear him preach. I know uh, Faith in Gulfport has him uh, uh, during the Beams rallies. They have him preach there. I, I know he's preached at Smite Camp once uh, when we were there. And maybe during the youth conference, I don't know if any of us have been there while he preached, but I think he has preached there uh, a couple of times and just a great man of God. And so that's just an excerpt from one of his messages. And I wanted to just to share that with you. Somebody has, uh, one of the churches has kind of taken that, put that together. I think it'll be a help to you uh, tonight. So uh, we'll play that and uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll play that and then we'll come back with our song service. All right, so let's pray. Let, Lord, we do thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all that you've done for us. God, I pray. Uh, that you would just uh, help the service tonight. May you have your will and way in our hearts and lives and speak to us in a great and mighty way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up. And he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here. And I fly a small airplane. And I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going to. 
And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me, and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head and he starts mumbling and he passes out, passed out. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, Tell, we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die, but I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're gonna make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. 
the voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning, a knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're gonna stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. All right, hymn number 348. Let's stand for this hymn. 348, we'll sing Redeemed. Hymn number 348 in your hymnals there. Sing out on the first. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of His presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. On the last there, I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps And giveth me songs in the night Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever I am Amen. Hit number 839 I'm sorry, 809. We'll get to that one later. 809, let's sing Until Then. In number 809, 809. My heart can sing When I pause to remember A heartache here Is but a stepping stone Along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on A 
until the day my eyes behold the city until the day God calls me home on the last there this weary world with all its toll and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife the soul of man is like a waiting falcon when it's released it's destined for the skies but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day god calls me home let's go back and sing the second verse there the things of earth will dim and lose their value if we recall their borrowed for a while and things of earth that cause the heart to tremble remember there will only bring a smile but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold the city until the day god calls me home amen you be seated we're going to sing 839 in just a moment but i'm going to ask you to do something for me all right ask, now don't get nervous all right you won't have to speak but 10 minutes that's all it is all right Hey, I, I, I believe it was Sunday school this morning. I gave a little bit of my testimony. Uh, I do remember that was May the 14th, 1982. I remember that because my dad wrote it in my Bible. That's the only reason uh, why I can remember that date. And I would often say that I was 12 years old, but actually I was 11 because my birthday's not till August, all right? I'm just thinking 1982, I was 12 years old. Uh, I was in a camper trailer, sleeping in the back of a camper trailer. My dad was in the front. I, I, um, I know it was in Gretna, Louisiana, but I didn't know that for a long time until I went back and read that in where he wrote in my Bible, and at the bottom he wrote Gretna, Louisiana, right? Uh, I can see the, the, we were, the camper was in the churchyard, and I, I remember a little bit about that, uh, but it was a Emmanuel Baptist Church, which has since merged with uh, Grace Baptist Church there, in Marrero, and uh, so I can remember that, right? That's what I remember about where I was when I got saved, all right? Now, one word. This is one word testimonies. I want you to say it was summer. I want you to say it was a car. I was in a car. I was at church. It was the month of this. Maybe you know a date. And right now, if you're saved and born again, you ought to be thinking about, okay, that's where it happened. I was at home. Who's starting? Just one word testimony. <laughs> there you go, Miss Patty. Blytheville, Arkansas. Library. That's right. <laughs> Amen. 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 That's a good place to get saved. Church. Church. In a car. Amen. 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 <laughs> Cindy. Amen. You was hunting for a bride, wouldn't you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. Home. 
Amen. Church. Church. Bring eight to seven in my living room floor. Amen. Brother Joe. In the bedroom. Amen. 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 Miss Lisa. My mom's favorite kitchen table. Amen. Jesse. Uh, it was a summer of 1997 on a trip to an airline highway. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Uh, Amen. Ella says in the junior church. And the junior church. Amen. Yes. At home. You can't. Amen. See, it's good just to remember. Just, just to give testimony, where he's at, what was going on. I, I love Brother Winfred Baker, pastor of uh, Trinity Baptist up there in Abita Springs. He was born over in Picayune, Mississippi. That's a good place to be born. He said, I was born at home. Same bed he was born in, 16 years later, he got saved at, on the foot of that same bed. Amen. That's, that's a good testimony, isn't it? And, uh, so it's good to have a testimony. Amen. All right. Anybody else? In your room. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right. 839. In my life, Lord. Let's sing that. Sing on the first there. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. Number 839. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. In my song, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my song, Lord, be glorified today. Church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in your church, Lord, be glorified today. Amen. Hymn number 60 for an offertory hymn. Hymn number 60, let's sing, He is so precious to me. Hymn number 60. So precious is Jesus, my Savior, my King. His praise all the day long with rapture I sing. To Him in my weakness or strength I can cling. For He is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Tis heaven below, my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to me on the second verse there. He stood at my heart's door mid sunshine and rain and patiently waited an entrance to gain. Watching that so long he entreated in vain for he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Tis heaven below my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to on the third verse there. I stand on the mountain a blessing at last. No cloud in the heavens a shadow to cast. 
If smile is upon me, the valley is past. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Tis heaven below my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to me. On the last there, I praise him because he appointed a place. Where Sunday through faith in His wonderful grace, I know I shall see Him, shall look on His face. For He is so precious to me. For He is so precious to me. For he is so precious to me. Tis heaven below my Redeemer to know. For he is so precious to me. Amen. He is so precious to me. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. All right, I'm going to ask Brother Ron to come and pray for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for saving my soul, Lord. Thirty-some-odd years ago, I didn't deserve the payment for my sins that you paid for me, Lord. And we ask that you come down and meet with us tonight in this small church in the heart of Mary, Lord, that you... Uh, Fight any distractions that may be in this room tonight, Lord, and that you uh, touch each heart and open each mind to receive the message that pastor's prepared for us, that he'll be sharing with us shortly, Lord, and uh, be with the pastor and help him to say only the words that you want him to say, Lord. Uh, bless the offering that we're about to take up and use it to your honor and glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. gave those testimonies I sure did enjoy that and uh, I think about brother Dale Aguiar their testimony is he um, not he was out door knocking knocked Miss Penny his wife knocked on her door let her to the Lord it's a good thing to do ain't it, ain't it? it's good amen I like that and uh, so but maybe maybe as different folks were saying I got saved here here this happened or where I was here maybe in your mind you're like I don't know. I don't know. You can, you can know tonight. Right. These things have it written unto you that you may know yeah. that you have eternal life. And I'm, I'm thankful that we have a no-so salvation. Amen. Amen. It's not just I'm hoping. I'm, I hope I make it. I hope I'm going to be all right. I don't live life that way. I want to know. Right? Yeah. Uh, there is a hell, and I, I don't want to chance that one. All right? And so you, you make sure of your salvation. Make sure of your salvation. And I appreciate those good testimonies. We're going to have a word of prayer. 
and uh, then we'll come back um, with some special music, and right after that, we'll have the video. All right, so let's, let's pray together. Lord, we sure do thank you, Lord, for the many folks that gave salvation testimonies just by telling us where they were at or what was going on or the date. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that uh, we can look back to a time in our lives where uh, we did realize we were a sinner in need of a Savior, and we trusted you uh, as our personal Savior. And Lord, I, I just pray, God, that you would just guide and direct the rest of the service. I pray that you'd be here with us in a special way. We thank you for what you're going to do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I missed out on heartaches this world feels every day. I missed out on a broken home that would steal my joy away. I missed out on all the things they said I'd miss out on. Oh, but somehow I have a heart of peace while their good times are gone. I've been sheltered by His grace kept in a safe place protected by the prayers of those who have always sought his face in a world of shifting sin i can hold on to their hand for they've guided me in how to run this race and as the years go on i'm sheltered by his grace Grace can take the sin away that stained a soul for years. And grace can keep a life that's pure from shedding bitter tears. And the grace that's brought me safe this far will safely lead me home. For the truth that they've instilled in me will last when they are gone. I've been sheltered by His grace kept in a safe place protected by the prayers of those who've always sought his face in a world of shifting sin i can hold on to their hand for they've guided me in how to run this race and as the years go on i'm sheltered by his grace and as the years go on I'm sheltered by His grace. Appreciate the video we just watched, with Brother David Gibbs, and uh, uh, he's a great, great soul winner. Amen. And I, I, I enjoy hearing some of the stories that he tells. And um, Brother Mike Ray, I appreciate the ministry that he has. But you know, those, those aren't the only. Um, or God's not limited to just them. God can use you too in the area of soul winning, all right? And I like to hear good soul winning stories, but I like to have some of my own. Amen. All right? You need some soul winning stories of your own. Amen? You need those in your life. God, God saved us, and yes, he's going to take us to heaven, but we're to, we're to reproduce. Christians ought to reproduce Christians. Amen? Churches ought to reproduce churches, all right? And so as we look at these videos on Sunday nights about soul winning, I encourage you to take something, glean something from it that you can use in, in your uh, soul winning approach. And, and uh, man, think about standing around the throne of God one day and the people you brought. Who, who are you going to bring? You're not going to bring your car. You're not going to bring your house. You're not going to bring your bank account. But you can bring some people. And I want to encourage you to have a burden for that, right? So let's watch the video. If it's during the holidays, I'm talking about relatives here for a moment. But let's think, uh, who's got an unsaved mom, dad, brother, sister, grandparent, someone that you're around during the holidays, definitely unsaved. Would you slip your hand up? Okay. A couple of thoughts on that. Uh, and I give this lecture uh, usually once a year at our church on a Wednesday night. You want to make sure that you're dressed up for these holiday meetings. You know, if your family's going over to all the unsaved relatives for Thanksgiving or Christmas, make sure you look sharp. 
Ask yourself, what would Jesus wear? And then ask yourself, what would Brother Treber want me to wear? You want to you wanna be dressed up. Don't have that torn T-shirt with the paint on it and the, and the pants, fellas, that don't fit anymore. They're faded and we're here. Man, you need to just look sharp. Now, you don't need a three-piece suit, but when you walk in, it ought to be like, whoa, who is this? Second, you want to do something with the person you're trying to win. The reason it's tempt sometimes during, during Thanksgiving is, you know, our family walks in, you know, we've got the Bible because we're going to read the Bible before Thanksgiving prayer. Now, man, it's just tents everywhere. Or you've got your Walkman on and got North Valley playing. And they're saying, who, who are you? What you want to do is bring your ping pong paddle if they have a ping pong table. You want to bring a basketball if they have a hoop. You want to bring some Uno cards or whatever uh, they play. Now, hopefully not poker chips and things like that. Why? When you do something with someone, it relaxes them. Bring a cake mix. Hey, we're going to make a cake. we got all afternoon. Hey, let's make some chocolate chip cookies together. You know what that does? It draws you closer to the person. And that's why sometimes students here at the college that are not careful, they start dating the unsaved co-workers because when you work with someone, you feel close to them. There's a reason we don't feel close to relatives. We never do anything with them. We see them once a year at Thanksgiving. Get saved. <laughs> the next year, did you get saved yet? All right, here's my new words. Get saved. <laughs> and no wonder they don't want to be around us. So you want to do something with them. By the way, let them win. I beat you again. Now, can I talk to you about heaven? No. <laughs> let them win. And girls, this is on a dating note. Let the guy win that you're dating. Well, I'm better than ping pong than him. Man, I beat him 27 times in a row. Good, he's going to marry your roommate. <laughs> Let the guy win. Well, I just don't see that way. All right, all right. A man's ego, I'm just telling you. Do something. Cook, shoot hoops, go to the store, make something build something, it just, it just lowers their resistance. Number next, get them alone. I know some of you girls right now, well, I'm trying to win this real good looking guy at work. I'd love to get him alone. No, it's not what we're saying. You're not going to win the hard cases in a group. You're not going to win them in front of a group. For instance, I guarantee you, let's say, let's say, and I don't know if President Obama saved or not. A lot of people debate either way. Sounds like he is, sounds like he's not. But if he walked in the room right now and we started witnessing to him, if he's lost, he would not get saved in front of this whole room. If he's lost, he'd get saved in Brother Treber's office one-on-one. -on -one. The rich people, the educated people, the hard cases, they do not get saved in front of a bunch of people. So where's that found? The book of Acts, Paul says, those that were of reputation added nothing to me. He said, I spoke to people in groups, but one-on-one -on -one or individually alone with those in reputation. Maybe King Agrippa would have been saved if it wasn't in front of a crowd. Maybe Felix, who trembled, got under conviction. Maybe he would have been saved if not in front of a crowd. So you want to pick those people off. Remember when I worked at UPS, People would mock, they would, they would cuss, they'd say all these bad things when we were at work in front of the crowd. But they were a different person when I walked outside with them just one-on-one. -on -one. And that's how you're going to have to win those people at work. Hey, you off? Me too. Walk me to my car. And as you're walking, witness, sit down on a bench or something. You're going to have to win them one-on-one. -on -one. Amen. Just some good things that'll help you. Amen. And certainly our family, that's a, that's a difficult situation there uh, to win our family. Uh, but uh, I, I want to say this about family. Um, you love your family. I didn't say you had to agree with them. I didn't say you have to go out, live like them, but you love your family. That's the, that's the family God placed you in. And you may be the only one 
uh, standing between them and hell, right? And uh, hey, everybody's family's whacked out. Yeah, don't act like it's not. Your family's just as whacked out as mine, right? Yeah. Right? That whole section back over there went, they looked at each other and went, yeah, we'll look at us. <laughs> That's the way it is. That's the way it is. But you know what? God loves them. They need to get saved. Amen? I mean, I know they got pink hair and gauges and man, that, but they need the Lord. They need the Lord. Amen. And so you love on your family, all right. You don't have to. Hey, you don't have to act like them, all right. You don't have to do the stuff they do, but you need to pray for them, all right. And um, and uh, man, give them the give them the gospel. Amen. That's important that you do that, all right. If you don't do it, who else is? And don't you want your family to go to heaven? Sure you do. Sure you do. And so pray for them, all right? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm out there with them 24-7 because some of the stuff they're doing I'm not going to do. I, and they know it, all right? But I, but I do love them, and I do want to uh, reach them with the gospel message, all right? Uh, Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. Got just a few moments here. And uh, we come to this judge here, a famous judge in the Word of God. Uh, most kids know about him. Most of us know about him. And uh, he messed up. He messed up. And uh, his life is a great example, though, uh, for us. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm not one of the characters in the Bible. Amen. We'd probably be the bad characters, huh? huh? I'm glad I'm not one of those in the Bible. And, but the Lord puts them in there for us to learn. So let's start reading in verse number 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means uh, we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And we will give thee, every one of us, eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And, Sep and Samson said unto her, If thou bind me with seven green whiz, that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up uh, to her seven green whiz, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the whiz as, as a thread of toe was broken with it, it touched at the fire, so his, uh, so his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me. And told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be, uh, mightest be bound? And he said unto her, if, thy, if they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith, and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chambers, and he brake them from off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto, unto Samson, Here are two. Thou hast mocked me, and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. Now he's getting closer now, isn't he? As she fastened it with the pen, said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awakened out of his sleep, and went away with the pen of the beam, and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee, when thy heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me, wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak, and I be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. She called for a man. She caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison uh, house. And boy, it's a sad story, isn't it? It's a sad story. 
But it's not just for Samson. I believe that uh, a lot of Christians have found their self right there. They found they've been in that place. And, and uh, of course, we can read the rest of it. I'm thankful that there is a God of second chances. I'm thankful that God will forgive. But I'm going to say to you, you know, sometimes we hear people say about young people, well, they just, they just got to go sow their wild oats. No, they do not. Did you hear that? they do not have to sow their wild oats. That's not a true statement at all. Right? They can live pure. They can live clean. They, they can live without ever tasting alcohol. Amen. They can live and, and, and have, have a marriage that come to the altar pure. They can do that. So it's 2022. You need to get with the times. No, I tell you what, we ought to get with the Bible. Amen. Right? So we don't have to live uh, like this man Samson. We don't have to do those things. And, uh, you know, maybe if you find yourself uh, in that situation, as David said, you know, God restore to me the joy of my salvation. And then he said this. He said, I want to teach transgressors. All right. Hey, you know, never glamorize your sin. Uh, I sometimes get a little aggravated at, at preachers when I hear them get up and talk about their sinful lifestyle and how they lived and how they lived and, and they seem to glamorize and then right at the end, oh, I got saved. They spend about an hour on how wonderful sin was and about one second on, oh, I got saved. Now, I'll tell you what, we ought to spend more time on the, hey, the Lord saved me out of a, a wretched place and, and God's been good to me and, and be careful about glamorizing sin. And by the way, uh, when you look at somebody else, don't ever say, well, it worked out for them because you don't know the baggage they carry. You don't know the tears they shed at night. You don't know what they're going through in their heart. Right. Well, never look at somebody and say, oh, it worked out for them. It'll be okay. No, it won't be okay. Because the Bible is absolute truth. Yeah. And there is a payday. Yeah. There is a payday. It will happen. It will come. And so we see the story of Samson and Delilah. Let's take a moment and pray. Brother Lance, would you pray for us? Amen. In the story, of course, there is Samson, there is Delilah, there's the lords of the Philistines here, and uh, they're out to capture Samson. Of course, Samson has been that thorn in their side and has defeated them time and time again, and uh, they were trying to come against him. They wanted to rid of him. I want to give you just really uh, three thoughts here tonight. Number one, this story of Samson and Delilah, first of all, there is a story here of love. The Bible says this, that Samson loved a woman. We're told that Samson loved a woman, and over the course of his life, uh, this is the third woman that we have record of. Uh, first, there was the woman of Timnah in Judges chapter 14. Then there was the harlot in Gaza. And now there's Delilah, and out of these three, uh, Delilah is the only one who says that the, a woman that uh, that he loved there. And uh, it's, it's the first mention there of the woman that uh, he loved. And, and uh, as we think about this, uh, uh, the fact that uh, Samson loved Delilah does not excuse any of his sin. All right. And by the way, let me say this about love. I hear this thought a lot of times. I say, well, I fell in love and now I'm going to fall out of love. Let me tell you, this, you don't fall in love and you don't fall out of love. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. All right. And so if you, if you buy into the world's idea, of, well, I think I'm just falling out of love with my wife or my husband. Oh, no. You make a choice to love them. Y'all okay? I'm sorry. It looks like I just bursted some bubbles out there. But you need to make a choice. No matter how they act, that's, that's not up to you how you act. All right? You choose to love that person, all right? And we've said before, we're all, at times, we're unlovable, all right? But love is a choice. And so, um, by the way, let's get into talking about young people, all right? Again, all right, say why, why, why we need to take them to youth camp and why we need to take them to, uh, to youth conference because, 
You know, we want to put them on the right pond to fish in, right? Yeah, you know? I mean, don't act all shocked and surprised if you send them off to the public school and they come back with somebody crazy. You know? If they come back with a, with a, with a dude with blue hair and gauges in his... It, oh, well, where'd you get him? Well, right where you sent me, Mom and Dad. That's where I got him from. All right? So that's why we take them to church and take them to church and take them to church and take them to church. All right? And we go... And, and by, that's a natural thing, all right? Young people, get you a menu. <laughs> Married people, give the menu back. You've already ordered. You give it back once you've ordered, all right? You give them menu, all right? I, I'm years ago. Well, in fact, we was over here at the Blitz team. I had the Blitz team and Ethan. This is probably, I don't know how old he was. He was probably in ninth grade. Bunch of young people in the gym, you know, girls and guys, they're playing volleyball and stuff. And I walked in, just sat down on the side, and Ethan, he come over, sat, he's hot, sweaty, he goes, hey. I said, yeah, see that girl over there? I said, yep, yeah. we just made serious eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> he did not marry that girl. In fact, she's married to somebody else now. But anyway, he had a little crush on her. What's wrong with that? Right? Nothing wrong with that. That's a natural thing. All right? They're going to look, and they're going to find somebody. You better put them on the right pond to fish in. That's what I'm saying to you. You better put them in the right place, all right, or, or you're not going to be happy. And so we see that Samson, all right, uh, met this woman, and he loved her. And, uh, man, you know, be careful about loving the world. Amen. And be careful about that. We apply this spiritually. I think sometimes as, as we get out there and start looking around, there's things, bright, shiny things that find our eye, catch our eye. Boy, don't be careful. The, the, the devil has the best lures out there. Boy, the, I mean, you say, oh, it never happened to me. Well, you know, let's just start with pastors. There's a lot of pastors out there that are no longer in the ministry that said, it'll never happen to me. It'll never, we need to be careful, all right? We need to realize that they're out there, right? And so the, uh, Samson uh, loved a woman. Delilah loved wealth. Delilah loved wealth. While Samson loved her, she apparently did not love him. Uh, the lords of the Philistines said, hey, we're going to give you 1,100 pieces of silver, each of us. I believe that is going to be in verse number uh, 5. And the lords of the Philistines came unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him. We may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. And there was about five of those, and someone said it equals to about $750,000 in our day and time. And they, they told her, they said, hey, you entice him. You entice him. The word entice means to be simple or to be gullible. It has the idea of acting like an innocent person in order to deceive someone else. Christians... Christians, we ought, to, we ought to have some wisdom, you know. Samson, you don't love me. You, and don't, I bet them eyelashes was from here to back there batting. <laughs> Samson, you don't, uh, sad puppy dog face, cue it, you know. Samson, hey, I guarantee your lost family do the same thing to you. Your boss at work do the same thing to you. Yeah, what are you, it's just one time, it's just this, it's just oh, who you love, who you love. That's why it's so important. You know, the most important relationship in your life is not your spouse, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not between you and your kids, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the most important, you better love the Lord. You better love the Lord. And, and so they, they said, hey, entice him there and uh, uh, get him to do something that he shouldn't uh, do. And, and boy, we ought to be careful about falling into the world's traps. Boy, be careful. Hey, think about this now. God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, looked straight eyeball to eyeball at the apostle Peter and said, Peter, wake up. The devil is out to sift you as wheat. I mean, think about that. 
Jesus comes down, God himself in the flesh stands right in front of you and said, you better be careful, son. The devil's out to get you. What happened to Peter? The devil got him. Don't you think, oh, I can handle it because you can't handle it. I can't handle it either. I'm just telling you, I mean, the apostle Peter thought, no, it's all good. The Bible says he went out and what? Wept bitterly. On the other side of sin, there's always weeping. Always weeping. So why do you preach that so hard? Because I don't want anybody to have to go through that. So, so I don't know why mom and dad so, you know, so strict. Well, maybe because mom and dad went through it. And mom and dad lived it. And they don't want you to have to live it. That's why they care. That's why they do it. Hey, listen, uh, the, the, the Lord doesn't want us falling into that trap. That, that he sets for us. There, there is a story of love. But they loved the wrong things, didn't they? Amen. They loved the wrong things. Quickly here, uh, there's is a story of lies. Verses 6 all the way to verse 14. Samson nor Delilah was honest in their relationship with the other. Neither one of them were being honest. Their relationship was built on lies. Samson's lies were senseless. Delilah begins to ask Samson about the source of his strength and, 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 he, and he plays with her. He, he starts out thinking, oh, I'm going to have fun with this. Oh, I got this. Maybe he said, she's just a woman. She don't get it. I got this. Don't look at me ladies like that. That's probably what he thought. <laughs> oh, yeah. Boy, was he... In fact, Delilah means feeble. That's what the name meant, feeble. She's just a feeble one. She's the weaker vessel. Nah, his lies were just senseless. Verses 7 to 10, he said, Buy me with seven grain withs. Verses 11 to 13, Buy me fast with new ropes. Verses 13 to 14, Weave us the seven locks of my head uh, with the web. Boy, he's getting a little closer to the truth, isn't he? He's playing with her. By the time he gets to the third deception, he's getting really close there. Well, you better be careful about getting close to sin. Uh, be, be very careful about that. Well, I think it'll be all right if we do this. Mm. Well, what's wrong with this? <laughs> Famous last words. What's wrong with that? Oh, they just, they don't want me to have fun. <laughs> they, they don't like me. No, oh, all along, the Lord loves you. He cares about you. That's why, that's why there's a, you say, well, you just got a bunch of rules. Oh, independent Baptists. They just old school, old fashioned. You know, I, I think the Lord wants us to stay far away from sin. Amen. Far away from sin as we can get. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, the Bible says. And enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, the Bible says it bringeth forth sin, and, when, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Nothing ever good happens. Nothing ever good happens. Drawn away means to lure, like, like game is lured from its hiding place or enticed, lured by a bait there. And in the end of it all, it brings forth uh, death. It brings forth death. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeded evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man, the Bible says. Paul Harvey, Paul Harvey told a story years ago about a, uh, the, the Eskimos and they have trouble with the wolves. They'd have trouble with the wolves coming in and uh, their, their livestock and different things that they were, they were, the wolves were getting. And they said this, they would take an animal and they, those Eskimos would kill an animal and they would take several knives up to the amount of like 20 knives, big, long, sharp knives. And that, that animal, they would take the blood and they would coat those knives. They would coat those knives in blood. And they would freeze, and they would do it again. They would do it again. They would do it over and over again. They would coat those knives in blood. And then they would take those knives, and they would, they would, put, they would put the blade up in the snow, all out there. And then they would take that animal, and they'd sprinkle more blood all around, throw the carcass of the animal out there. Those wolves would come that night. They would sense that blood. 
they'd begin to eat a little bit of the animal, they'd lick some of the blood uh, in the snow, and then eventually they'd find that, the, that blood that was frozen on those knives, and they'd begin to lick the blood. And it came to a point that they didn't even realize those knives had cut their own tongues and they were actually lapping and licking their own blood. And the Eskimos would come out and find all the wolves dead in the morning. That's what the devil does. Just lures you away. And you don't even realize it. He wants to sift you as wheat. He's not, he's not playing fun games here, folks. He, listen, you, listen, this South Shore Baptist Church can be gone tomorrow if the devil had his way. He hates the unity that we have. He hates the soul winning that we do. He wants it gone tomorrow. And the quicker he can get it done, the better off he's going to think he is. Hey, listen, what I'm saying is be careful as he lures us away. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, the Bible talks about consumed by their own lust. Delilah's lies were sinister. While Samson was toying with Delilah, she was, uh, someone said this, one commentary read, she was playing him like a cheap fiddle. That's what she was doing. Boy, lying. She was setting him up for the fall. Delilah used the same tactics back in, uh, in, in, in Judges chapter 14 as the woman in, in Timnath did. She, she played the, if you love me, you would card. You know that one? If you love me, you would. And, and she begins to beg and she begins to plead. And, and uh, boy, that's again a, a picture of how sin works. That's just how sin uh, uh, works. The Bible says this in Proverbs uh, chapter 6. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? The answer is no. Yeah, no, you, you, you can, whatever the sin is, it will burn you. Sin always costs. And that cost is never cheap. That cost is never uh, cheap. And so uh, we see theirs is a story of love, loving the wrong thing. There's a story of lies. Sin will never tell you the truth. Number three, there's a story of loss. Verses uh, 15 through 17. Delilah uh, wore Samson down and told her, and he finally told her the truth. He told her about his hair being a symbol of his Nazarite vow. And uh, man, uh, how that got him in the end. We want to see some things, though. Delilah's losses were considerable. In the end, Delilah really didn't lose anything at the moment. But I want you to know this. If we could look into hell this, more, this evening, we'd probably find Delilah. So she did lose. She did lose. By the way, don't, don't be envious of what the world has. Amen. Sometimes we look at the world and go, oh, they, they got it. They're headed towards a place called hell. You don't see their end. Don't be envious of what they have. Delilah's loss were considerable. And, and uh, the Bible says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Oh, she got some money, but wound up in a place called hell. hell. Samson's losses were complete. He lost, first of all, physically. He lost his freedom in verse number 21. But the Philistines took him put out his eyes and brought him down to God's. He lost his freedom. He lost his vision. He lost his dignity there. Uh, he's having to, do, uh, to, to grind there in, in the prison house like a slave would. He lost his dignity. But he lost spiritually. He lost spiritually. Let me read this to you. Just some thoughts here. Most expensive haircut in history, somebody says right here. Did you know this? That the average woman, boy, I'm going to get in trouble here, okay? When I start with the average woman, spends $50,000 on her hair in a lifetime. That's what I said when I read that. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> Y'all don't even believe that, do you? <laughs> Did you know that the average woman spends two years of her life washing, styling, and setting her hair? You can believe that. Yeah. Am I getting in trouble yet? <laughs> Uh, did you know that the average woman spends 41 minutes per day working on her hair? I don't know if that's true. Did you know that a recent survey found that during the last month, 54% of the women surveyed got, <laughs> I like this, <laughs> they got madder at their hair than they did their husband. I can believe that too, right? <laughs> Americans spend over $7 billion a year on hair care products. Whoa, 
It's crazy, isn't it? Hey, as much time as people are spending on their hair, I think Samson should have spent some more time on his hair, protecting his hair. And well, here's what I'm saying to you. Hey, I think we need to spend some time protecting our testimony and our spirituality. But we give it up so quick. We, we let the devil and the world kind of lure us away. And we need to spend some time. He lost his fellowship with God. The Bible says this. The Bible says that the Lord was departed from him. That's a sad commentary. That's a sad commentary on a man. That the Lord was departed from him. He lost his spiritual discernment. Look in verse uh, number 20. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. Here's what the Bible says. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He didn't even know it. Isn't that sad? I mean, here's a great man. He didn't even know God's gone. His discernment. His spiritual discernment uh, is uh, gone. He's gone. He lost his ministry. Because of sin, he lost his ministry. I mean, man, God had blessed him, given him a great ministry there in Israel, and because of sin, he lost it. Hey, there, there's, some, there's some qualifications in the Bible for uh, the two offices of the, of the church are the pastor and the deacon. And there's some qualifications there. See, what does that mean? Well, it also means there can be some disqualifications. I, I, I can think of a lot of people, there are even pastors that I know that according to the scriptures have disqualified themselves to be a pastor. They've disqualified themselves. Now, here's what they'll do. They'll try to twist the Bible and say, oh, no, I, I can still be in the ministry. It's funny, I'll take a look at those ministries and here's what I find. Those people are disqualified. For, they've been now... They can do something for the cause of Christ still, but as those ministries, they cannot because they've been disqualified. All right? And I look at the ministry now, and here's what I see. Number one, it's either carnal, very carnal, very worldly. Or number two, it's some of the most mean-spirited people I've ever been around in my life. You look at that, you go, huh, something's wrong there. Hey, church, you ought to have some spiritual discernment. You need some spiritual discernment, all right? And what I'm saying is, you can lose a ministry. You can lose that. Hey, the Apostle Paul said this. The Apostle Paul said this. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. You say, is there forgiveness? Always. Always there's forgiveness. Is there consequences? Always. Always. There's a, lot, there's a lot of good men that I mean preach, but hey, they disqualified themselves. They disqualify themselves. We need to be careful about that. Sin will disqualify you from even certain ministries. There's always forgiveness, but there's always consequences. Always consequences. I told you about the church there uh, out west that uh, their head usher, all right, wound up stealing from them, and he was a federal agent wound up stealing from them hundreds of thousands of dollars. He figured out a way he could steal out of the offering. He went to prison. He came back and apologized to the church. And he sits in the church today. Is he an usher? He disqualified himself from that ministry, didn't he? I think the people are showing some discernment there. Hey, sure, there's forgiveness. We forgive you. Hey, sin will do that. You know what happens? You know what happens? We're, we're all human, right? It brings distrust, doesn't it? I don't know if I can trust them or not. Right. You say, what if someone molested a kid? Are they welcome at this church? Yes, they are. Can they teach junior church? No, they cannot. In fact, they ought to realize that, you know what? I'm going to be watching every move they make. Right, yeah. Well, I don't like that. I can't help you. You welcome to be here. They're all welcome to be here, right? But that's that's what happens when sin comes into our lives. That's why we say, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't be on the other side of sin like the apostle Peter and wept bitterly. There's always forgiveness, always forgiveness, but there's always consequences for that sin. That's why we preach so hard. That's why we say, hey, be careful when that nice shiny lure. Be careful. Be careful. 
Satan wants to sift you as wheat. You say, well, what if Samson didn't sin? Think about the man of God he could have been. I mean, what a great man. I mean, every kid's hero, right? I mean, we even name our dog Samson, right? I'm not talking about the teacup chihuahuas. I'm talking about the German shepherd dogs. That's, you know, we, that's strength. But he sinned. And he paid the price. And that's why we warn people with love and kindness and compassion. That's why we love. Hey, be careful. Be careful. I'm preaching this message to me just as much as I'm preaching to you. Be careful, be careful, be careful. I like that old song. Oh, be careful little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Beware, be careful. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word, Lord.